Unpicked, it's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 95, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. My guest today, Michael Abelman, splits his time between his family's foxglove farm on British Columbia's Salt Spring Island and Soul Food, an urban farm on the downtown east side of Vancouver, British Columbia. Michael has been farming full-time since 1976, starting as an orchardist and evolving into a wide range of vegetables, fruits, grains, dry beans, and livestock. An early pioneer in the urban agriculture movement, Michael has long focused on the creation of good jobs and production quantities of food. In this episode, we dig into production systems that Michael developed at Soul Food to allow that 4.5-acre urban farm to meet the challenges of growing in an urban environment including how they farm on top of pavement and how they mitigate the risks of uncertain land tenure. In addition to producing $350,000 worth of food each year, Soul Food provides employment to individuals who struggle with poverty and addiction, and Michael shares his perspective on managing labor under those challenging circumstances. Michael's 120-acre farm on Salt Spring Island includes 30 acres of hay and grain and six acres of fruits and vegetables marketed on the island and via the ferry into Vancouver. Michael shares details about marketing in the two very different marketplaces, and we get a good look at his white asparagus production, which I thought was kind of cool. We also get to hear about Michael's experience with global agriculture in the 1980s and how that's influenced his approach to farming in North America. I worked on Michael's Fairview Gardens in California back in 1991, and it was great to get back in touch with him. I hope you enjoy the show as much as I enjoyed making it. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is sponsored by Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality compost and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. And by Farmer's Web, making it simple for farms to work with wholesale buyers such as restaurants, retail stores, and schools. Farmer's Web software streamlines your wholesale operations, making it easier to work with your buyers and with more buyers overall. Farmersweb.com. Michael Abelman, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Hey, it's so nice to be with you, Chris. Thanks for having me. So glad you could join us today. Now, you and I, Michael, we... We haven't had a lot of contact over the years, but we do go back a long ways. Your Fairview Garden Farms down in Goleta, California, was actually the first commercial farm that I worked on back in 1991. Yeah, that's right. I remember that going way back. And I think even even before that, didn't I I had some some involvement with Deep Springs College, which I think you were involved with at one point as well. So I actually came to Deep Springs after you were there, but that's why I called you and you were you were crazy enough to accommodate my <laughs> my goofy schedule coming out from that weird little college out in the middle of the desert. So that's an awesome college. Actually, I loved it. You know, I did, too. Weird and awesome. I would go both both <laughs> ways. But you're not in California anymore. Can you can you give us a little bit of a background on the projects that you're working on right now? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Yeah, so I am uh, now, uh, you know, almost 1,400 miles north of um, where I spent uh, 25 years on that uh, little farm uh, in uh, Goleta, California, uh, working on two uh, fairly significant projects. One is our family farm, which is a 120-acre mixed farm on an island off the coast of British Columbia. Uh, where we raise uh, kind of a range of things. We've we've got a, a small grain operation and doing our own milling, et cetera. We've got um, uh, quite a few fruits and vegetables, a little bit of livestock, uh, some hay. Uh, and, um, yeah, so it's a fascinating place because it's we have essentially taken over one of the original homesteads on Salt Spring Island um, and um, have really uh, continued... Uh, on the shoulders of uh, of a long history that existed on this land, it's it's wonderful to be on a really old place, uh, living and working out of very old buildings, and um, seeing the different layers that have taken place here over the last hundred plus years. You know, and, uh, so that's been it's it's been a very wonderful project. It's a piece of land uh, so different from what I was doing in California because it's uh, surrounded. Uh, all of all of our farm fields are surrounded and intersected by swaths of intact forest. There's a whole uh, intact ecology. We're in the heart of a of a uh, water system here. Creeks running through, um, and so it's uh, there's a lot of wildness around us um, and uh, a wonderful um, history uh, and uh, the opportunity to grow on a scale that I was unable to in in California. Uh, but, you know, after a few years being on the island, I was kind of missing being in the trenches and was uh, invited to a meeting 
On the downtown east side of Vancouver, the downtown east side is the neighborhood where the term Skid Row was coined. It's a logging term. Uh, and uh, the people in that neighborhood were um, grappling with how to deal with um, a community of people who live there who are um, uh, all facing long-term drug addiction, um, uh, mental illness, and it is also the poorest postal code in, in all of Canada. And they wanted to do something innovative, and um, we came up with a very, very interesting urban agriculture model. We started uh, on a half acre and have, now have moved to four and a half acres. We're employing uh, 25 people, generating uh, 25 tons of food annually, that's 50,000 pounds, uh, off of four and a half acres of primarily uh, pavement. Um, and uh, have had a quite an impact on the lives of individuals who were previously considered to be, as they say, hard to employ, have multiple barriers to employment. So that's been an exciting project as well. It must be interesting to be bouncing back and forth between downtown Vancouver, British Columbia, and the what looks like a very rural Salt Spring Island. It is very schizophrenic, to be honest with you. And uh, but I, you know, I reflected back. You know, I'm um, I'm 62 years old. I started farming uh, with the Sunburst communities uh, in um, uh, when I was 18. And um, interestingly enough, as I reflected, I've realized that uh, for most of my farming career, I've been on more than one farm. Um, and I don't know what that's about, but um, uh, it is in this case the the two farming operations couldn't be more different. And in that way, yes, it's uh, it can be challenging. Um, uh, I spend only a couple days a week uh, in the city on the project that I described, uh, and certainly in the peak of the summer season, less so. Um, but um, both projects uh, have very particular and unique demands. You know, I mean, it's they're, they're, they're like I say, they are so different. It's unbelievable. <laughs> And yet they both satisfy a part of me that I think needs to be uh, fed and needs to be expressed. And, uh, you know, Salt Spring Island is a wonderful place, incredible, very rural. Um, the farm we're on is amazing uh, and has lent us opportunities to do some amazing innovations and things. But the truth is that, you know, many of the people who live on Salt Spring Island or who come to Salt Spring Island are, you know, are of privilege. And uh, I, I really felt the need to use my skills to um, address some real significant needs uh, that exist pretty much in every low-income community anywhere in the world. And um, two of those are fresh food, and the other is um, meaningful employment jobs. And uh, the model that we created was really specifically focused to address both those things. Well, first of all, the physical model is pretty amazing. Um, we are uh, we designed a system that allows us to both farm on top of pavement uh, and uh, on, uh, if necessary on top of contaminated soil and also to move on short notice. Now there are a couple things that are common to every urban community everywhere in the world that are major obstacles to safe food production on, on a significant scale. One is contaminated soil because most urban soils are too contaminated to grow in. And the other issue is the cost of and value of land uh, that most uh, developers, landowners, uh, whether they be private or, or municipal, are not interested in providing land to, um, to farm production um, because they can't deal with the political ramifications of having to ask them to move in the short-term leases that would be associated with that. So our system is, we've designed this box system. Uh, these boxes have forklift tabs, interconnected drains, uh, little um, uh, holes for uh, uh, hoop inserts. Um, they are stackable, they are nestable, they allow us to move on short notice, and they isolate the growing medium from uh, either pavement or contaminated soil. And we have 10,000 of them. <laughs> um, and uh, this system has essentially addressed in one elegant, very simple design, these two fundamental challenges that exist everywhere. So that's the physical system. Uh, the social system, which is really the, the important one, is um, 
that we are working in this neighborhood, the downtown east side. If you walk down the streets or alleys of this neighborhood in broad daylight, you would see people with needles in their arms uh, on the sidewalks or someone pirouetting in the middle of the street high on crack. Um, this is a neighborhood unlike any place in North America. Uh, I think if you visited that neighborhood as I did early on, you would bring judgments and prejudices. But since I've been there, I have discovered that those same individuals uh, have hearts and souls and creativity and the desire to do something meaningful in the world. And um, the project that we set up was simply that, to give people a reason to get up out of bed, a job to perform that was needed in the community, plants that depended on them, a community that was reliant for the food. And the results of that have been uh, quite quite profound socially. And we have people working with us now for over seven years who didn't hold a job for seven months previously, a couple individuals who were hardcore drug addicts that are now supervisors and performing uh, at a level as farmers that um, uh, that is really highly skilled. It's really, it's pretty remarkable in a short amount of time. So, you know, um, this is a model that is truly agricultural in scale. Um, as I said, 25 tons of food. Um, uh, and it was important for me to really demonstrate that if we're going to use the words urban agriculture, which are thrown around quite freely these days, <laughs> then we need to respect the agricultural part of that term and, and uh, operate on a skill level and a scale that was respectable, credible, you know, and um, could really uh, generate serious amounts of jobs and food. So this being a farming show, I'm, I'm curious, and, and I want to I want to come back to some of the social aspects, but what are you using for soil? Yeah, I mean, so this is the big question. No, we don't... Um, you know, we fully understand, as I said, you can't, you cannot safely grow in any of the soils in in the neighborhoods we work in. And I, I would venture to say quite um, confidently that that's probably the case for most urban soils. Um, and those contaminants are, you know, uh, multifold depending on what was there before. You know. Um, so we, uh, in order to do that, we actually have to bring soil in. Uh, we were, we have been lucky because there was a um, company in the region, about a half an hour uh, out of the city, who was making soil from the waste of the city. Okay, so they were composting and creating some beautiful soils, and we were able to draw on on those soils and essentially. Um, uh, they are hauled in. They are pumped into the boxes using a pump truck, if you can believe it. Uh, and the challenge uh, from there is maintaining uh, soil biology and soil fertility within a closed box system. Uh, very, very different challenge than in an open field situation where you have this vast reservoir of biology and fertility to, to kind of draw on. Um, in this case, we find that uh, organic matter in particular burns up very fast, and uh, the challenges of doing this uh, and maintaining soil fertility in, in a box is, uh, is a really interesting and new game for me. And I'm, you know, I'm, like I say, I'm only eight years into it, but uh, we've made some interesting discoveries. Uh, we've had to um, come up with some strategies that, uh, that kind of um, mitigate this without having to haul in vast uh, quantities of uh, material, which is impossible in the city. So, you know, uh, certainly, you know, compost teas and worm castings and things that have high concentrations have been really beneficial. And when you talk about these these growing boxes, you talk about pumping soil in with a pump truck, all of this sounds extremely expensive. <laughs> what is, is, is the, and I, I'm always curious about this, is the project is it is it a financially viable thing, or is it something that's that? And it, and it sounds like for good there would be a lot of good reasons to get funding for something like this. But are you getting funding for this from the outside, or are you are you making this roll with what you're picking off the farm? No, that's a pretty critical question, especially for people in the farming world. So when I started on this project, uh, my uh, philosophy and opinion was very strongly. I agreed to take part, but I said, look, this has to support itself like any other farm by the pound, you know, pound of tomatoes, you know, carrots, what have you, by, at a time. 
but after a couple of years realizing the uh, that our our uh, hiring uh, approach and our social agenda was to hire people from the neighborhood without skills uh, many of whom not only were did not have any farming skills but were dealing with some pretty heavy stuff um, uh, I realized that we would never ever be able to operate on the same playing field as any other farm and that our social agenda was was so worthwhile and and so powerful in its effect that I came to um, accept that we would always have our hand out to some degree. So the project generates about $350,000 a year in products grown and sold, and we have to raise about another $300,000 a year to support the social agenda of what we're doing. And I should add that that's not just that additional fundraising is not solely to pay the staff from the downtown east side uh, or to even train them, but we're also running a number of, you know, we, we run a financial literacy program, we do driving classes, we do canning classes, we have a breakfast program. Um, so there's, a, you know, we're buying rain gear for people, you know, things that are normally not always part of a regular farm's operations, maybe the rain gear, but um, so there's a very... Um, and, and a lot of management time, of course, is spent in dealing with people's stuff. You know, we're not social workers. Uh, we're not addiction experts. Um, we are uh, not psychologists, but we still have to spend a fair amount of time helping folks uh, who, on a daily basis, are um, having challenges. So, yeah, no, it's not... Um, it is not self-supporting uh, on its own. I do hope and still have a goal of, of achieving that eventually. Um, the infrastructure alone, as I described and as you brought up, is a uh, very expensive infrastructure. Uh, the boxes we designed and had manufactured out of plastic, we tried wood initially, which was a disaster. Um, and of course, the soil, bringing the soil in is not cheap. Um, but once that foundation is in, um, it is conceivable to me that um, this could eventually uh, be far more self-sustaining. Uh, the biggest challenge is the short-term leases on the land. And therefore the potential that you're going to have to pack everything up and move. Exactly. Which you can keep the boxes, but then you've got all the material handling expenses of moving that soil from one place to another. Well, the, the soil would remain, the system is set up so the soil will remain in the boxes. Each box has its own, the boxes have forklift uh, slots underneath and they are entirely movable and stackable. So so we can move the entire system. In fact, in a year, we have to move one, one uh, two-acre site. And um, so, yeah, it is, it is movable. Um, but, you know, there's costs associated with that as well, of course. I mean, this is really, I have never positioned this, um, a project as uh, I don't refer to it as sustainable agriculture, nor do I know of any very many farms that could actually um, comfortably call themselves such. You know, I think sustainability is a question, series of questions we ask ourselves. You know, uh, not a place that I think any of us have arrived. But in in this case in particular, this is really particularly designed in uh, very particularly for an urban application. And uh, for uh, situations where um, uh, there is no other option, you, it's very difficult to to uh, plant seeds into asphalt or into soils that are uh, contaminated. So, tell me a little bit more about the challenges that you face on the human resources side. I mean, all of us, I think, as as farmers and especially as vegetable farmers, have experienced challenges at some level with with people. I mean, the work itself, relative to the other work that most people are doing in the world, is is very different. It's it's much more physically demanding. It it requires working in all kinds of weather. Something that you know you don't get out of working in a McDonald's necessarily, but now you've kind of taken all of the challenges that are inherent in finding good employees on a market farm and elevated those by bringing in people who don't know how to work. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, um, you know I think that uh, uh, I would have to say that when when, uh, when farmers get together in the winter months, I think it's probably uh, the most common topic and probably one of the biggest challenges, of course. You know, we... Um, you know, we do. We have uh, this incredible amount of attention now focused on 
on the work we're doing, uh, 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 suddenly some recognition that um, uh, food and local food in particular is important. Uh, lots of films and books, and um, and uh, yet, in my view, the one thing that has not changed fundamentally is the number of people who are actually uh, on the ground doing the work. And those of us who are managing farms, uh, whether they're our own or someone someone else's, uh, I think are seeing this issue play out more acutely uh, than ever. Um, uh, you know, most um, younger people um, are not being raised on farms, certainly, and they're not being raised to do physical work. Um, the almost entire focus is on you know pushing buttons on a keyboard. <laughs> um, and yet, uh, you know, that can only go so far when it comes to growing food. I and mean, at some point, somebody has to grow food, build houses, make clothing, do the real work of the world that we all depend on. And um, so I think that um, it is a, it's a huge challenge. Um, we've found it, that it's getting worse. Um, I think the project, it's interesting, the project in Vancouver, in the city, in some ways, the individuals we employ there, with all of their significant deep challenges, and I'm talking about hardcore heroin and, and crack addicts, um, people who have really significant mental illness issues, in many ways, though, they are so thankful to have those jobs because no one else will hire them that in many ways they perform at a, a much higher level and with much more um, uh, focus uh, when they are there, and that's the key word, than the well-scrubbed white kids that uh, that might come uh, to our rural farm on Salt Spring Island. And so I think that, uh, you know, it's a huge question. Um, you know, in California and most of the states now, of course, um, uh, it's people who have crossed the border, in many cases illegally, that are doing the work that Americans will no longer do. We actually guard the borders to keep out the people who are who are actually growing the food. Canada has a legal uh, seasonal agricultural workers program with um, paid flights, housing inspections, uh, wage requirements, full health care for people from Mexico. And uh, it's not perfect but it's certainly a lot better than what we see in the States. Um, we still are reliant on local people to do the work on our farm um, on the island, but it is probably our biggest challenge, to be honest with you, you know. And um, we have, you know, uh, had some great success, um, and a number of farmers out in the world who, uh, over the years, we have uh, helped launch, <laughs> which we're proud of, but I think most people doing this work are struggling with this issue. I think it's really fundamental. So how have you worked to engage people? And, and, and again, particularly interested in talking about your work at Soul Food with folks that, that are facing some fairly extreme challenges. What have you done to make that work? Well, it's imperfect. I have, you know, I'm at this point in my life at 62 years old, I, um, I find it's, far more valuable to um, be open and willing to express my those areas that I have not been so successful in than those areas I have. And the new book that I wrote is certainly a great example of kind of a warts and all um, story about a project, this project in Vancouver. Um, so, you know, I'll start off with that and just say it's, it's certainly imperfect. Um, but I will say again that to have individuals employed with us for seven plus years who never held a job for very long, uh, individuals who um, may go home at the end of the day and, and uh, uh, stick a needle in their arm, um, but while they're there, while they're present, are actually performing quite well is is I think a great accomplishment. But even more than that, it's uh, it's the sense and and if you know if, if you read the interviews in the book, you'll see these are people who. Um, for in many cases, the work at Soul Food Street Farms is their only meaningful engagement. It's the only thing they have going on in their lives that that has meaning and purpose and sense of community. And I think the sense of community is a big part of it. I'll give you an example. If someone disappears, uh, they fall off the wagon, they're gone for a few days or a week or even a few weeks, 
when they return to work at Soul Food Farms, they are not asked, where, are you, where have you been? They're asked, how are you doing? And this is a big, a fundamental difference. Uh, the employment model we have is actually established and set up with enough backup uh, knowing that on a particular day, even though you know the the orders still have to be harvested, and there's you know 500 bunches of radishes that have to get picked, and in so much time, we know that's the case. We have to run the business, so we have enough backup individuals to cover, knowing that almost every day someone's not going to show up, right? Um, so this kind of flexibility that would never exist in a normal uh, employment model or a regular farm um, has allowed us to uh, keep people engaged who normally uh, would no one would have ever had the patience for you know and the result of that has been that they want to stay involved and they the longer they stay involved the more their skills develop um, uh, and the more their skills develop the more we feel like they're needed the, the less they feel like they have to lean on other things to, to support them, you know? And so, um, I think that, you know, um, you know, this is really a, uh, a question for the people we're employing. Obviously they can't be here today on this phone call, but, but, um, you know, I do have people who tell me the only reason they're still alive today is, uh, because of the job they hold and the community of farmers that, that they're associated with. Um, and the fact that they feel needed, they simply feel needed, you know? So, um, so this is, uh, you know, I don't think there's any secret sauce or, uh, technique or anything uh, about this except acceptance, uh, patience, um, uh, and, uh, people who don't feel judged who have previously been heavily judged. I think there's a lot to be said for that. that and that's, that's not necessarily a skill that comes easily, is it? Well, certainly not. And, you know, I know I've, it's been a long ride for me, you know, um, uh, you know, I, I think, as I said, you know, I, I mean, my only relationship with the, with the downtown east side of Vancouver, this neighborhood, Skid Row, um, previously was driving through on my way into, uh, the, uh, Fraser Valley to pick up, um, you know, uh, parts for farm machinery or tractor or, or, um, farm supplies uh, because you have to pass through that kind of that corridor. And, uh, you know, uh, boy, I had all my judgments when I drove through that neighborhood. It was, it's, it was kind of a shocking scene to see, you know. And so now to be working with these folks and actually have relationships with these individuals and, and some for many years um, has been uh, as much to my benefit as it has been to theirs because the amount of courage and perseverance it requires on their part on some days just to show up for work is unbelievable. None of us could live with that, you know. Um, you know, nobody's choosing to be drug addicted in this neighborhood. In fact, many of our staff want nothing more than to be clean. Um, but it is such a difficult ride, you know. And so, um, yeah, so they give me, uh, you know, I am constantly um inspired by them <laughs> more than they are of me you know we just provide a really awesome environment for people to come and put their hands in living soil on a day-to-day -day basis uh grow nourishment for the neighborhood we require that all of them participate at the farmers markets we don't keep them hidden which is really amazing socially because it demands that they break through some of their social inhibitions and it even more important it requires that the public um, deal with their own stuff because when, you, when you're when you walking along a farmer's market and you see somebody handing you a sample that doesn't look like a farmer and actually looks like they just came off the street, you have to deal with your own sh** on that. And um, it's been a wonderful way of, uh, of kind of creating a new uh, idea of who people are that we normally would not relate to. And there are those who choose not to shop with us. Uh, simply because of those people we're employing. That's an interesting thing, and we accept that. Michael, I'm I'm touched by how you talk about this. Uh, I'm touched by how it's not just about about you. And I think I'm not quite sure how to say this, but I wanna I wanna kind of go back to I think it was your first book where you were out traveling the world 
and looking at agricultural systems around the world and engaging with people that you didn't know in cultures that you weren't a part of and making a human relationship and and learning about farming and and how that has kind of brought you to where you are today. I don't know. I, I don't feel like I'm asking a good question, but I'm just going to I'm going to put that out there and let you run with it. No, it is a good question. You know, like in in um in 1983, I made my first trip to mainland China. Uh, I was actually not on my way to mainland China. I was on my way to uh, fulfill a, a childhood dream, which was to go hiking in the Himalaya Mountains. It was a, it was midwinter, a time off from my farm in California. But a friend of mine was living in China. I stopped to to visit with her, and. Um, I found myself, uh, you know, uh, just so uh, intrigued by what was happening there at that time. And I began uh, uh, a fairly long walk outside of the city of Chengdu uh, into the rural areas, which were at the time uh, um, unaccessible by anyone from outside of China. Uh, The Chinese government was not interested in portraying the peasant culture at the time. But I had an experience. I, I uh, got to the the outskirts of that city, into the rural area, um, hiked to the top of a hill, looked out and beyond. I saw something that was really remarkable. For as far as I could see, it was this vast network of fields of vegetables, small fields, um, intersected by waterways, um, most intensive production I've ever seen, uh, all being worked by families working together. Uh, I discovered these were these families were working land that was not only worked by their parents and grandparents, but by their great-grandparents and all the way back in some cases for 4,000 years. 4,000 years, yet those fields at the time still appeared fertile and productive. And I, I just couldn't fathom, how is this possible? I mean, I'd seen land in the Central Valley that was played out after only a decade. Uh, so what was going on here? And that really triggered a, a, a really strong interest to understand um, not only what was going on there in China, the oldest agricultural tradition in the world, but what was going on amongst other traditional cultures. And, you know, as a photographer at the time, I felt this uh, this pull to begin to record the remnants of those traditional cultures, many of which have inspired what we now know of our organic farming movement uh, and so many other movements, um, permaculture and biodynamics and you name it. Uh, and so I, this, that began, I think there was, gosh, seven or eight winters that I went out uh, during my farming break to uh, look at different cultures around the world, uh, culminated in that first book. Uh, I was really young and naive when I did that book, um, but I was clear that I, you know, this was not some romantic um, golden view, uh, view of some golden um, uh, past, um, but it was an attempt to, to look at, okay, where are whose shoulders are we standing on in this movement, and what can we learn from the remnants of those wonderful traditional cultures? And and you know, if you fast forward, um, I think there is a connection. I mean, um, you know, I there's no question that that experience um, uh, has really informed uh, the work I'm doing now, who I am, how I see the world, how I see farming. Um, the work I'm doing in Vancouver. I mean, um, we started the Center for Urban Agriculture in 1980, what was it, mid-80s, based at Fairview Gardens in California. Um, uh, When you used urban, the words urban and agriculture in the same sentence in the mid-80s, people looked at you like there was something wrong, you know. And now, of course, there's this huge movement around that, you know. Um, I don't know how much of it is truly agricultural, but Certainly, there's a big movement around that. Um, and so, you know, I think that when all of us as, as um, farmers look back through our history, um, I think we all have to recognize that there were all these different uh, inspirations, uh, mentors, seeds that were planted in our minds, ideas that we got from who knows where, um, observations we made both on our own farms and other people's farms. All these things come together to form who we are and how we express um, that creativity on our own land. And each place, that's the most amazing thing. You know, Every farm I've ever been to 
and I've done a couple books that profile other farmers, you know, they all are so particular to the, they, those canvases are particular to the farmer artist that is the personality and history and background and culture of the farmer artist who has painted them in, you know, and I think that's a, that's pretty cool. You know, that's a really wonderful thing to see. There is no, no single farm that is not totally unique and individual to the, to the person that's, uh, that's running. And I, I love that part of it. It is true art in that respect. On a really practical level, how did the, how did your travel and how did your encounters with so many farmers over so many years influence the farm that you ended up with on Salt Spring Island? Well, first of all, I was, you know, on that Fairview Gardens project for, gosh, well over 20 years. And um, at a certain point, you know, um, I really wanted to live someplace where, um, you know, the my neighbors cared more about uh, something more than what was going on with their lawns. Well, and I, and I do want to give just a, I want to pause here and give just a little bit of perspective because I do know a little of the inside story at, at Fairview Gardens. But I mean, when when I was there, you were in the middle of a fight with your neighbors, and these are neighbors that had moved in next to a farm that was already there over the roosters making too much noise. <laughs> you were there for that. Yeah. No, I was actually threatened with jail time. Uh, district attorney actually was going to put me away for the crow of my roosters. And um, uh, that was the third a series of incidents that happened over a period of years. You know, the compost was one. Uh, we were composting and accepting material that used to head for the landfill and um, signs advertising our person that was the roosters. And so we used each of those instances as a way to try to inform the public of um, how disconnected we could become and how important that farm was for the community. It was a hundred year old farm. It had been there for a hundred years. The neighbors had been there for just a few years and we were getting complaints about what we had always done there. You know? And so I, I did take it up as a as a uh, fight, but not necessarily a fight between myself and the neighbors as much as an opportunity to educate an increasingly urban world about um, the changes that were taking place. Um, three, three acres, three hour of fine agricultural land, uh, they've developed. This was a farm that used to extend all the way around. It was now surrounded by uh, tract home shopping centers and islands, in fact. Um, and uh, I felt responsible to um, not just, you know, kind of fight for our survival, but to also um, use our situation as a way to educate people. And so, yeah, if you fast forward, you know, at a certain point, I tired of that. I, I really, um, I wanted to be somewhere where people, you know, cared about, you know, soil fertility, and I could have a conversation with my neighbors about, you know, the, the their particular grain crop or, you know, that there was some, <laughs> some instincts uh, that still um, could be shared related to food and agriculture. And I was living in a farm neighborhood, and so we moved 1,200 miles north. And I think in many ways, the farm that we ended up on uh, is as different as uh, a Fairview Gardens project as possible. It's 10 times the size. Um, it's very rural. It's quiet, you know. Um, and um, it does give me the opportunity to play with some uh, things that I didn't previously get to play with, like uh, grain production, for example, which I'm very excited by. You know, um, uh, we do a lot of dry beans. You know, to be able to to raise livestock that's you know larger than a um, a chicken is kind of awesome, you know, which was our only opportunity there. You know, so. And did your experience with third world agriculture? translate to things that you're doing at Fox Love Farm? I think that, um, not directly necessarily. I think that, uh, I, I used to get asked that question a lot after the first book came out. Um, uh, and in the end, I think that my inspiration from traditional cultures uh, and their agriculture in various parts of the world was, was less specific or technical. Um, and more on a bigger level. It, and I felt that um, you know, what I was seeing in many of those places, uh, I described China, but I saw it in other places as well. 
first of all, there was still an intact, this is at that time, I'm talking about the early and mid-1980s, you know, there was still an intact culture around agriculture. And, and um, there was still, uh, you know, mind you, this was, for, for many of the people I visited, this was simply about survival. It wasn't like how we're approaching it now, you know. This, this was self-sufficiency for many people. It was, these were not market farms necessarily. Uh, uh, although I did visit numbers of those, uh, I was looking at in the end the, the inspirations were things about things like land tenure and uh, the culture around agriculture and the and um, uh, you know the fact that there were still people participating in a livelihood and a profession that. Um, was disappearing at the time in, in North America. You know, we're having a resurgence now, but it was disappearing, you know. And so, um, aside from particular techniques, um, I think well, I wanted to just say, look, um, we have dismissed peasant culture and the wisdom that is, that is inherent in thousands of years of agricultural uh, development in those parts of the world. Let's revisit that and understand that we all came from that, that organic agriculture evolved from that. What are the what are the bits and pieces that we can draw on, you know? So And I remember just little bits of that from, from Fairview Gardens when you talk about, you know, paying attention to what we've what we've lost. And I remember uh having a dinner there that you made uh serving uh barbecuing salmon on on Peachwood trimmings from the orchard, you know, and just it's probably wrapped in fig leaves. <laughs> probably wrapped in fig leaves, yeah. And 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 just that. So for me, I you know, I was I was 20 years old. I was you know, I was still I was very enchanted by the whole idea of having my hands in the dirt. I I I had never done that before. You know, it was all very it was all very romantic. But even when you when you when you talk about that, when you talk about you know the the fish and the and the using the trimmings using the leaves you know all of that coming together around a a table full of people and and that's something else that i remember very particularly from from your farm was that everybody that was involved in the farm was was celebrated um, you know, for me, you know, I, I was there for eight weeks. I was celebrated when I left as a as a white kid going back to college. You know, the the Mexican crew that you had when we went out to to a dinner, you brought everybody. It wasn't just the interns. It wasn't just the market people. It was it was everybody who who held a hoe or traded, you know, traded cash for sweet corn or, or yeah. anybody on the farm. And I, I don't know that it feels to me like that sort of level of involvement with your staff really says something about about what you're talking about here with with the operation in Vancouver. Yeah, I think it's true. You know, it's interesting because, I, you know, I've made every mistake in the book in terms of human resources. Um, <laughs> and, and yet, uh, I look back on the Fairview Gardens experience, and I had the same crew there for 17 years, I think. And, um, oh, my gosh, do I miss them. Uh, they were – it was an amazing crew, um, both the Hispanic and the white crew. Uh, for, for whatever reason, we had some really good longevity. And, uh, boy, you know, when you have that kind of long-term relationship on a crew, you, it's almost like you read each other's minds. It's like a well-tuned – machine, uh, you know, it allowed me to, the only reason I could go away in the winter months is that I had people who, you know, everybody knew each other's jobs, you know, and we did, um, we tried really hard to, um, even out the playing field there, uh, not easy to do, um, but we tried, um, so that everybody felt that they belonged, that they were honored and respected. And again, we made a lot of mistakes. We, you know, I think everybody does, but, um, I think, you know, it's interesting if you look back and you ask yourself uh, about what you're most proud of in your life and your career in agriculture, uh, it's interesting. I mean, certainly we can all point out various technical accomplishments or the food that we grew or maybe even some people that how much money they made, you know, uh, how many people they taught or inspired. But in the end, it's the, it's the human element. Um, that really stands out, you know. Um, I, Alec Coleman and I started uh, 
a group called the Agrarian Elders, which we, we now meet every other year um, as part of the Center for Theory and Research at the Esalen Institute. And um, it's interesting. These are folks, uh, there's about 30 of them who have been farming for 30, 35 years or more. And out of that entire group, uh, only a tiny percentage has their children, their own children, who are wanting to continue or participate or pick up the standard, you know. And that's a really telling piece in this conversation and related to the question you've asked because, you know, it really does beg the question, you know, who's going to do this in the future? And, I mean, I've always said if you want your kids to farm, don't raise them on one. Um, and I, I do realize that, um, you know, we keep coming, you know, Chris, you and I in this conversation have kept coming back to the same topic. And I think it's, it is, there's a reason for that. You know, The transition, the succession is in my mind, been one of the, the most prominent um, pieces of the agrarian elders conversation that we've had. Cause I think all of us are concerned about that. You know, uh, who's going to take over? How do we pass on our knowledge? How do we do it respectfully to the younger generation so they, they can apply their own creativity and we're not, you know, kind of standing over them. You know, these are very difficult questions that I think uh, many of us are asking. Any answers? Well, you know, it's. I think it's so individual. Um, you know, we have had this conversation uh, for years now, and um, I honestly, I wish I could say, I wish I could just give you a series of bullet points, but because this is so personal. And um, and so social and so partic- you know particular to the culture of the farm that we operate in, our families and our you know relationships. It's really it it's hard to say. I you know there are people who whose kids have decided to come back to the farm who swore that they're you know that it was the last thing they imagined they would do because of how they were raised and the amount of stress they saw their parents under. You know when they were growing up, you know? Uh, so the, in other words, it doesn't make a lot of sense that those who choose to return, you know, sometimes I think it's a matter of percentages. You know, if you have enough children that maybe one of them might decide to stick with it. So maybe bigger families. Would be <laughs> <in there>. so, <laughs> I mean, you look at that in traditional cultures and that's actually, uh, that is a strategy. It's, it, you know, it's certainly not a great strategy for the, future of the planet, but it is a strategy of survival that a lot of you know, folks will have big families, uh, number one, because infant mortality rates are high, but number two, so they'll have more hands to, to help carry the load, you know, and uh, these are practical considerations. So, so with that, we're going to stop here, get a word from our sponsors, and then we'll be right back with more from Mike Labelman of Fox Club Farm and Soul Food in British Columbia. Perennial support for the Farmer to Farmer podcast has been provided by Vermont Compost Company, makers of living potting soils for organic growers since 1992. In the transplant greenhouse, all of your investment in plant material, heat, labor, and overhead depend absolutely on the performance of the media where you expect your plants to grow. And that media has a really hard job to do, produce a healthy plant in just a few cubic centimeters of soil. When I started farming, I focused on getting the cheapest ingredients I could to make my own potting soil and later on finding cheap potting soil already put together. But I found out what so many farmers have, that saving money on inputs doesn't always result in increased profits. Jennifer at Vermont Compost can tell story after story of customers who switch to less expensive options, but who have come back to Vermont Compost for the consistency and the quality of their potting soils. And even though it's not all about saving money, Vermont Compost's fall pre-buy program can help you get what your plants need at the best price with the best shipping options. Don't miss out. Vermont Compost Fall Pre-Buy Program runs September 21st to December 21st. Taking care of growers by taking care of transplants since 1992. VermontCompost.com Additional support for this episode provided by Farmers Web, software for your farm. Farmers Web brings greater efficiency to how you work with your buyers, saving you time and increasing the number of buyers your farm can work with overall. Use this software to inform your buyers about your farm, your product availability, and delivery days and zones. You can also enforce order minimums, lead times, and more. With Farmers Web, your customers can place their orders online 
or you can take their orders in other ways and enter them in yourself. You can define payment terms for different buyers, give select buyers special pricing, and generate pick lists, packing slips, and product catalogs for your customers. You can keep track of payments that you receive by check or COD, or buyer payments by credit card go right into your bank account. Farmers Web can even help you coordinate deliveries with neighboring farms. A flat monthly fee means that no amount of orders or number of buyers affects your costs, and you can pause, cancel, or switch plan types from month to month at any time, even during the off season. There is no annual commitment. Farmers Web is available to farms, farmer cooperatives, and local food artisans nationwide. FarmersWeb.com. All right, and we're back with Michael Abelman. So, Michael, you've got this farm, and we've 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 talked a lot about about soul food in, in Vancouver. Let's, let's talk about Foxglove farm on salt spring Island and salt spring Island is, is located. Well, maybe you could describe it. I've kind of got a visual of, of yeah. where it is, but, but maybe somebody, maybe you could help us get that picture. Yeah. So, so, you know, the Gulf islands, which salt spring Island is the southernmost Gulf Island is an, is the Northern, they're the Northern extension of the San Juan islands, which uh, go up through Washington state. Um, in fact, uh, you know, from Salt Spring Island, you can really just essentially, you could see over the border, you know. Um, so we are the largest of the Gulf Islands. The, the the Gulf Islands sit between the mainland where Vancouver is located and Vancouver Island. So they're in those protected waters in between both. So we're, um, you know, we're uh, by ferry, we're about, uh, well, an hour and a half to the mainland. <laughs> Uh, or about 45 minutes to Vancouver Island. We're fairly close to Vancouver Island. So you've got about how many acres of vegetables? Right. So the farm in total is 120 acres, but there's a fair amount of that that is still in uh, in forest. Uh, we do roughly, there's about 30 acres in hay and grain and dry beans. And then there's about six or seven acres roughly, uh, quite small, in um uh, fruits and vegetables. Um, so, uh, you know, the intensive, uh, part of this has been scaled specifically to the access to, or lack of access to labor, you know, and, um, uh, we've had to been really smart about that. And also to the fact that our markets, I mean, we have a, it is an island. We have made an attempt to sell the majority of our food on the island, but the reality is we still are uh, having to send roughly about 30% by ferry off island, most primarily into Vancouver, uh, heavily focused on restaurants there. So, um, yeah, our our farm system, the crops we're producing, um, is very much scaled to the limitations of the population and the market here on the island. To the access to uh, resources, it's very expensive to haul materials in, um, and. Uh, uh, so we, and actually to access to labor, those, those three things really have dictated, uh, how we design things. So obviously things like grain, uh, are, can be quite wonderful. We have our own, um, medium size, uh, commercial mill, so we can do some milling. We have, uh, you know, things like dry beans are also wonderful in this environment, but we do a lot of fruits and vegetables as well. A lot of asparagus, both white and green asparagus, uh, lots of berries, blueberries, raspberries, strawberries, nightshades, of course. And we're playing with, you know, we're we're always experimenting with different things. You know, we do sweet potatoes, we do some baby ginger, we do, you know, playing around on a small, very small scale with stuff that's uh, kind of out of the ordinary here. So how many people are there on Salt Spring Island? Yeah, so Salt Spring Island has a population, a permanent population of around twelve to 15,000. Uh, the population doubles in the summer. It's a popular place for people to come. I like to say, you know, the population of 12,000 and 12,000 opinions about everything. <laughs> we, we refer to Salt Spring Island as an argument surrounded by water, you know, so <laughs> a lot of independent minds here. We love that. You know, we fit right in. <laughs> How much of your produce are you selling there on the island? Yeah, roughly about 70% is sold through. There's two farmer's markets a week that we do. Uh, plus, we sell to um, uh, some local restaurants and stores, and um, and we have a, a CSA program as well. So um, so we're still, um, you know, we're still holding strong at about 70%. Interestingly enough, you know, we've trained a number of new farmers on the island. When we arrived, we didn't have a whole lot of competition here. And now most of our competition are folks that we've trained, but, you know, the population still remains the same. So so uh, it forces us to be, continue to be creative, 
uh, not only with what we grow and how we grow it, but uh, where the foods are getting distributed. And for that 30% that you don't sell on the island, how are you getting that to market? Yeah, so we, uh, during the growing season, which is roughly seven, eight, eight months, uh, it could be year-round easily, but we choose to uh, take some time off in the winter and work on you know, my other projects. Uh, so during that peak time, we uh, uh, do a run to Vancouver every week, uh, delivering to uh, uh, primarily restaurants. So we deal with some, probably 25, 30 different restaurants over there. And um, uh, so that's, you know, that's quite an endeavor. It's, uh, it's a big job, but it is, uh, it's worth it. We have uh, fairly fixed minimums. Um, our costs for going over there are quite high in ferry costs, et cetera. So we have to, you know, make sure there's a, enough to make it worth it. Um, and, uh, yeah, so the availability list goes out every Sunday and then we get our orders in and generally, uh, Wednesday night deliveries into, into the city. And you talked about designing an extensive model for production there because of the lack of labor availability, um, is that something you do in all of your enterprises? Do you have are your vegetables set up in such a way as to minimize the labor input? I mean, more so than I mean, I think everybody wants to set up their vegetables to minimize the labor input because that's your major cost. But have you taken other, I guess, what we might call extraordinary steps to do that? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, um, you know, I think. Um, certainly after 40 years of hitting your head against the wall, you, you learn a few things and um, certainly my technical skills have improved, but I would not necessarily um, uh, refer to myself as a you know really uh, excellent technician like many farmers that I know who are. Um, but you have you, in this case, in this situation here, I've been forced to be really smart because as I said, there's no labor force available here. Um, so it's interesting. This it's a kind of a two-edged sword. On one hand, we have actually scaled back to some degree in the last few years, um, in order to uh, create a primary focus on sales to the island. So we're not having to haul too much off island. But when you scale back, of course, then it's hard to um, be able to warrant the use of you know or the expense and investment of of various. Um, pieces of machinery, cultivating equipment, et cetera, uh, because your your scale becomes too small. So it's kind of, you know, we're kind of working from both sides. We have a full full size combine, for example, for our big grain fields, but uh, but we're you know there, the the machine relative to the scale of grain we're producing is is almost a little silly. But it was a used machine. It was pretty cheap. Um, it, it of course requires three days of maintenance and repair for every, you know, day we might use it. (laughs) So, um, but I think, um, that we have, what we really have done well, I think is, um, and I think it's something that most growers evolve to at a certain point is you find out those things you really love to grow and that you love, they're often the things you love to eat. (laughs) Um, and you generally that you can that you really resonate with they become uh, your signature products we have probably 10 of them you do those really well they become kind of the, the core of your uh, broader crop mix and those also hopefully um, resonate with the local market uh, in our case because in the summer months we have a huge influx of people coming to the island as visitors we grow a certain percentage of what I call tourist food, uh, you know, uh, strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, <laughs> carrots. <laughs> um, but we also grow for the local community. Um, and we grow, we have to grow a certain percentage of things that have longer lifespans, that have stability. You know, we're in a situation here, if, for example, if a market rains out or bombs out for some reason, which rarely happens but can happen, we could be, you know, stuck holding the bag for, you know, thousands of dollars worth of products. So how do you balance your crop mix to protect yourself from that when the market to um, any kind of support market around that is too far away? You know, those are, so 
you know, thinking like an island is how I describe it, uh, both in terms of soil fertility measures, in terms of labor, in terms of crop mix. It's very important to think like an island, you know, to imagine that you do not have um, this vast support system or land mass around you, that you have to work within the resources that exist here, both fertility-wise and labor-wise and market-wise. And, um, and so we have done that through scale, through particular crop selection, um, and through some farming systems that I think reduce the amount of labor that are involved, you know. Um, so I'm happy to get into that a little bit more if you want. Yeah, let's, let's dig in. Give me, you know, some, throw some practical examples our way. Okay, well, first of all, in this climate, and you know, I, I would probably go further and say in most climates, but certainly here, um, the use of uh, unheated uh, high tunnels very important. You know, in our case, we move them. Uh, we have uh, movable tunnels, which allows us to do to you know uh, continue some form of crop rotation, uh, whereas you know uh, leaving those tunnels in place. So we're using um, solo hay groves that that we can move around. Uh, they have, a, uh, they're adjustable in terms of uh, length and size. Um, our fields are, it's a very difficult place to design rotations because our fields are not um, even sized. Uh, very rare to have any single field that um, mimics any other one. Um, so we're using, you know, the tunnel houses are important. They're giant umbrellas in a climate that can be uh, quite wet in the shoulders. So we need to protect crops in the spring and the fall, uh, less from cold and more from rain. In fact, you know, um, we also use low tunnels um, uh, or uh, caterpillar tunnels for things like strawberries to keep the rain off of them. Um, we are, um, you know, from a for soil fertility perspective, heavily focused on cover cropping. Um, both uh, annual and longer-term perennial and, and pasture-related cover cropping. Um, as an island, we are not in a position, as I mentioned, to be hauling in vast amounts of fertility resources, so we have to create them from within, right? So um, so we're fortunate, unlike my experience at Fairview Gardens, I have enough land to be able to um, create some longer-term rotations. But we use very intensive cover cropping religiously here. That's important to us. Um, the grain crops that I mentioned, uh, the grain and bean crops, are um, uh, while they have some value in and of themselves, um, they are um, have equal value as rotational crops. You know, uh, and so um, we really have to view that way. We're never going to compete with uh, you know the multi-thousand acre grain producers who can who have that economy of scale. So we have to view the grain production as have, having multi-benefits, you know, uh, both the production itself and the, um, the fertility benefits and rotational benefits. Uh, every grain crop is planted with um, double seed with um, uh, clover understory. So there's that whole benefit that takes place. The, the wheat gets harvested, there's uh, clover growing underneath. Um, uh, we also value add that grain. So again, we there's no would be no point in the amount of acreage of grain we have to be selling it as uh, raw raw seed. Uh, so we mill it. We can sell flour. We have a substantial size wood fired oven. We can sell bread. <laughs> so there's some value adding that can take place. Um, yeah, I mean the asparagus, another wonderful crop. Um, one of the crops that we do send a fair amount. Uh, into Vancouver because we do some white. Um, and the white uh, really maximizes the profits of the uh, asparagus planting, you know. Um, it's a unique product, you know, and, and that's sold to restaurants primarily. So tell me about producing white asparagus. Yeah, well, it was a big signature crop for me when I was in California all those years ago. And in fact, I still can go into certain well-known restaurants in San Francisco and get asked, when am I coming back to, <laughs> to grow <laughs> asparagus? You know, that should be a little cue to someone down there. But nonetheless, uh, um, 
basically, if you were to travel in the spring in uh, various parts of Europe, uh, you know, um, the Netherlands or um, uh, Germany, um, uh, and you were go- to go into those markets at that time of year, you would never see green asparagus. In fact, you'd probably be run out of town if you showed up with it. You know, it's all white. Um, so there's a long tradition there of it here in this country. When I, I remember when I first brought white asparagus to a farmer's market in Santa Barbara, this is probably 30 some years ago. Um, people walked by and turned their noses up and thought something terrible had gone wrong in my field. <laughs> <laughs> so um, basically, it's very simple. I mean, the European tradition is that those spears are blanched or the light kept off of them with soil. Um, we realized years ago that the energy requirements for doing that were far too high, uh, both in terms of tractor work, movement and churning of soil, which we didn't want to do, and in terms of harvest. And so we developed a system using um, low tunnel hoops and a dark material that we put over them that allows us to lift the material for every harvest and harvest those uh, uh, perfectly pearl white spears, you know, and that has become a very uh, kind of important crop for us over the years. Uh, again, huge thing for us in California, and a little bit lesser so here. You know? Yeah, but like you said, one of those crops can be a signature crop for you outside of Salt Spring Island, and kind of give you that hook into the marketplace out there, so that you do have a place to dispose of your excess. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, we used to grow these um, Mar de Bois strawberries here, the French strawberries. And, uh, you know, there was some following around that, but my gosh, the, um, the cost of doing that was so extreme and the perishability of it, we finally came to our senses. <laughs> so there's a lot of things that, you know, you, you know, you, you can certainly create a niche around anything, but at some point you have to evaluate, um, whether you have the stamina for it, you have the right systems to support it, um, whether the market is there. Um, and we've tried just about everything over the years and, and I think it continues to evolve. I mean, that's the beauty of it. You know, you, you continue to experiment, uh, something does well for a period of years. Maybe somebody else comes into the market. Um, you have to, you have to be willing to constantly shift and change. I think that's a nice note to take and turn towards our lightning round then, Michael. Can't wait. So what's your favorite tool on the farm? Oh, my gosh. Um, Well, believe it or not, uh, I have a couple of them. And it's funny. I I would have to say, uh, in terms of hand tools, uh, you know, the wheel hoe is certainly high on the list. Um, uh, And believe it or not, the stainless steel digging fork. (laughs) Um, I I love the feel of that tool. Um, You know, it doesn't matter how big your scale is. At some point, it's... Um, there are one or two hand tools that just seem invaluable, and the stainless digging digging fork, in particular, the handled stainless digging fork, is really important to me. On a on a tractor level, um, the, I have to say my favorite tool is the is the spring tooth um, chisel that I have. It was left behind by the previous owners of the farm, and um, my gosh, that one very simple uh, implement um, does such a beautiful job in these particular soils. And I say that very carefully because, again, these these favorites, um, it may not, I may not have it as a favorite or uh, have the same relationship with it in other soils, but certainly here it's the perfect tool. Just opens up the ground beautifully, um, is used for... Um, a uh, number of purposes, both before and after cropping systems, you know. Um, I'm trying to think of what else I really love. Oh, my bean sheller. <laughs> so, yeah, a, what do you do for a bean sheller? I have um, uh, a roto fingers, which was made in Mississippi. It was originally called the Mississippi sheller, but they call it roto fingers. And this is a tool unlike any other, beautifully made um, uh, machine that has rotating, rotating drums, uh, and the within the rotating drum are a set of rotating fingers, and you can actually shell um, uh, beans in the fresh stage. And when we're talking about things like flagellae or some European shelling beans, 
there's a long tradition that in the late summer of fresh shelled beans, not dry, but fresh shelled beans. And this is the only tool that I know of that actually allows you to do that. You know, if you've ever tried to hand shell flagellate beans, uh, you'll know that it's an impossible task. And so we're able to offer them uh, fresh shelled. And so that's a, that's been a, that's an awesome tool that we have. Uh, for the market, we have a pepper roaster that we, um, uh, we had built up here. Um, something that's fairly common in the Southwest at most farmers markets, the, management owns one and people buy their peppers and go to a central location and have them roasted. But we, that's, that's not a tradition up here. So we actually had one made and we roast peppers at the market. That's a wonderful tool at the farmer's market. Um, trying to think of what else is really fun here that we, um, are really, uh, resonate with in terms of tools and implements. Um, yeah, pretty simple. Where did, where do you come up with the, the pea sheller, the bean sheller? Oh yeah. Well, it's been years. Um, I've had these shellers. I had, I had one at Fairview Gardens uh, been over 20 years ago, and I don't even know that the people that are, were making them were. It was a very small kind of home operation in Mississippi that was producing this machine. Um, it's been at least 16 years or so since I would have been in touch with these people. But this is a beautifully made device. It's not only uh, incredibly functional and does something that no other machine I know of does, but it's also wonderful to look at. <laughs> um, the drum is made out of wood slats and the, you know, the, it's got a couple different motors on it that operate different turning mechanisms. It's really something else. <laughs> and I'm just curious, you mentioned the stainless steel digging fork. What role does that play on your tractor scale farm. <laughs> well, it's interesting because um, there are still things I, you know, that I choose to do um, by hand. Um, for example, um, we don't grow a lot of potatoes here. We grow some, uh, but it's not a major crop. And we primarily grow fingerlings because, you know, everybody grows everything else. Um, and uh, I have no potato digger. Uh, you know, I don't even have a single row digger. So um, we have these beautiful forks. And I would venture to say for the scale that we're growing potatoes that we're probably uh, able to harvest as fast as a single row by the time I hook up the harvester and go through the whole process. Um, so these are wonderful because the soil slips right off the fork even at any moisture level because it's stainless. They're heavy. And I, I can literally go down and dig, uh, loosen up a full row and open it up uh, quite quickly and then come back and, you know, pull all the potatoes, you know. I think, obviously, if potatoes becomes a crop that we decide to do much more of, um, it would be, it would not make any sense to be doing it the way we're doing it. Um, there are other things, you know, like um, digging forks. We have a small area uh, uh, that we have maintained over the years of raised beds uh, for odds and ends, uh, culinary herbs, and things that we don't want to grow on a field scale, right? And uh, you can go in with that fork uh, and do various things, uh, whether it's prepping a bed or uh, you know, replacing plants that, you know, you, you can't, certainly could not bring a tractor into that uh, particular plot. So, so I, you know, I, I, I still feel like maintaining my contact with, um, with, uh, those kinds of hand tools is really important that I don't ever want to not be capable of, or have the tools to do those kinds of jobs on that kind of level. Cause it may, there could be a time when we were doing more of that again, you know, maybe that's where I'll end up doing it all by hand. Great. And how did you get started in farming? I mean, I know this is going to the way back in the way back, but you didn't grow up in this business. No, my, um, Grandparents and great-grandparents had a very heavy influence on agriculture in Sussex County, Delaware, and Southern Delaware. Um, in fact, there are pieces of my great-grandparents and grandparents' lives that are in the Agricultural Museum in uh, in Southern Delaware, uh, which happens to be right next to the NASCAR racing track. <laughs> I wrote about that in my last book, you know. Um, and so I grew up uh, every summer going with my grandfather, what he called downstate, 
and along the way, stopping a trip that should have only taken two and a half hours was usually a half a day because he stopped along the way to visit all of his friends, uh, primarily in the farming community down there. And we'd sit there with the Dewey Sheehan for an hour, just cutting open cantaloupes or peaches on his back porch and just talking while we're eating away or uh, at the Indian River Inlet, uh, picking up crabs or visiting his favorite um, uh, um, uh, mustard green. They, they loved Southern Delaware has a very strong Southern culinary tradition, so they loved um, uh, turnip greens, mustard greens, all that stuff. And he, by the time we'd arrive at our destination, his car was loaded <laughs> <laughs> with the products of all his friends. You know, and I have to say, I um, um, I think. You know, that was while the last thing in my imagination, if somebody had asked me what I'd be a farmer was ever agriculture, those experiences became part of who I am. And I think genetics, we think of genetics as physical traits, but I'm discovering more and more that there is a lot more to uh, genetic makeup that informs who we are, who we become, what <clears throat> what our skills and strengths are. And... Um, so I mean I you know um, no there's no way I you know I didn't I, I didn't my father was not a farmer although he had a massive garden that he he ran every year he always shot deer for the freezer he was kind of into that stuff but it was my grandparents' influence in many ways. And where did you actually get your start? Well, I started uh, at Sunburst Farms, which when I joined that agrarian commune in the early 1970s. Um, they were the largest producers and distributors of organic food anywhere in North America with uh, semi-trucks crisscrossing the nation. And so I was really lucky. I, I knew nothing about uh, production farming, but I was thrown into this scene. We had 4,000 acres of land. Um, we had a, a operating goat and cow dairies. We had uh, four natural food stores, a uh, juice plant, a major distribution warehouse. Um, and I, within four months of being a community, I was um, asked to manage the 100-acre parent, organic parent apple orchard that was in the high desert valley east of Ojai, California, that was owned by the community. And I knew nothing about orcharding, uh, managing people. I was 18 years old. <laughs> and here I was directing a a uh, crew of about 30 people, most of whom were older than I was. You know, That orchard had been abandoned for 15 years. The branches between the trees had become so intertwined that you couldn't see the, the alleys down the middles of the road. Um, I had this 1930s copy of Modern Fruit Science. I had the journal from the guy who ran the place the year before. And I had a copy of uh, Goethe's famous quote, which is still attached to my wall here in my home. Whatever you can do or dream you can begin it boldness has genius power and magic in it and that was attached to the the door of my 20-foot unheated trailer and and you know that experience was awesome it was uh i got you know i had i got beat around i didn't know anything i um had the opportunity to um to really uh experience agriculture in its most raw form <laughs> and uh after five years I think I learned a few things uh resulted of that and I think um um uh my beginnings there were such that I in the end I realized that good farming had less to do with fertile soil and uh, refined technique and more to do with the fact that uh, uh more to do with people who love their land have bring passion to 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 that land and to the work they're doing and love to feed their communities. And in that case, at that community, that was certainly what was going on. We were, it was a communal experience and that's what informed who I was then and probably who I am today. And what's your favorite crop to grow? Um, I would say, to be honest, I, you know, I brought up asparagus and I think asparagus is just an awesome crop for many reasons. I love it aesthetically. I love to eat it. Um, I love it as a perennial. I'm, I'm, you know, really love growing perennials. Um, and um, it's delicious. It's um, really good for you. 
um, everybody loves asparagus, and it doesn't go on and on and on for many, many months. So, so, <laughs> so you're, you know, I don't, I don't get tired of it. You know, it's one of those things that comes. You're, you're enamored for the time it's there, and then you get to let go of it. You know, and and you appreciate it the next time around. And finally, if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? Uh, it would be number one, uh, not to take yourself so seriously <laughs> um, to um, understand that the beauty of farming, the wonderful part of farming is that it teaches you um, the essential lesson of life, which is impermanence, uh, that everything is um, passing through. Uh, and if farming, if there's one thing we might learn from farming, it is, it is this um, constant change that's taking place in, in a living biological system and that all things that we deal with are so impermanent. Um, and as such, um, if I had understood that as a young person, I think that um, uh, perhaps instead of being so incredibly serious and focused, um, uh, I, I probably could have relaxed around it a little bit more in the early years. You know? <laughs> um and, you know, that farming is really about um, the community of people you're working with and the community of people that, you're, that are eating the food you're eating. And um, that when those, both those communities are happy, um, then the food tastes better and the, and the farm produces better. And, you know, um, you know, the cliche, the farmer's, the uh, uh, best fertilizer is the farmer's footsteps on the field. I think, you know, I take it a little further than that. I'd say that when, when our staff are happy, then, then, uh, inevitably, um, I hear from our customers that the, how delicious the food is, you know, there's a direct relationship there. Thank you so much, Michael, for being a part of the farmer to farmer podcast. Certainly my pleasure, Chris. Nice to be speaking with you again after all these years. Hey, Michael, before I let you go, um, you did just come out with a book. Yeah, new book, number four, uh, just out after, what, four plus years of working on it. Uh, it's, um, it's called Street Farm, Growing Food, Jobs, and Hope on the Urban Frontier. Street Farm is the name again. And uh, Chelsea Green published this one, and I've, it's been a, a real pleasure working with them. But this, is, um, this book is very much uh, uh, probably of all the four I've done, it's the one that I think people um, – really need to read because it uh, it's not just my story. It's the story of the individuals that we're working with on the downtown east side, many of whom have had a, quite a tough life, how food and farming has affected their, their experience, uh, how we did something on a scale that uh, hadn't really been done before in the city of Vancouver. Um, and uh, yeah, I think there's some really fun uh, stories and some heartbreaking ones as well. So I hope, uh, hope people will check it out. Have a great day. Okay, man. Take care. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 95 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast, and you can find the notes for this show at farmer farmerpodcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Abelman. That's A-B-L-E-M-A-N. I am very excited to share with you that following numerous requests, we are going to start publishing transcripts for each episode of the show, available for free on the show notes page for each episode. Transcripts for this episode are brought to you by Earth Tools, offering the most complete selection of walk-behind farming equipment and high-quality garden tools in North America. EarthTools.com And by Growing for Market. Get 20% off your subscription with the code PODCAST at checkout. GrowingForMarket.com Okay, so you can get the show notes for every Farmer to Farmer podcast in your inbox, as well as being able to get them online, if you sign up for my email newsletter at farmer to farmer podcast.com. You can support the show by going to farmer to farmer podcast.com slash donate. I want to make the best farming podcast in the world, and you can help. Whether you're supporting the show on a monthly basis through Patreon or showing us your love by leaving us a review on iTunes or Stitcher, your support matters. Thank you. One last thing, please let me know who you would like to hear from on the show through the suggestions form at farmer to farmer and I'll do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running.